SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. Our speaker today is Marie Moyer. Marie is the uh, assistance coordinator for the L'Arche Association of Lethbridge. And when you mean, mean assistance, these are young people or adults who come from various parts of the world, including Canada, to work with people with intellectual disabilities. Uh, she has had a long career in this field. She's been with L'Arche for the past 20 years. Uh, she has degrees in theology and anthropology and is, brings a lot of compassion and strong commitment uh, for working with people with intellectual disabilities. Her topic today is people with intellectual disabilities and the ongoing quest for belonging. Marie? Well, I'm, um, I just got my first pair of progressive glasses and I'm learning how to use them. So this will be experimental. I'm grateful for the opportunity to see my notes and see you, so we'll see how it goes. Thank you for inviting Larsh to be uh, here with you at SACPA. We really appreciate the opportunity. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. So I'd like to begin with a somewhat related graphic to the state of all of us right now. It says, the most powerful tool of oppression is keeping you so busy with the daily struggle that you don't have time to connect all the dots and become truly enraged. Um, I'm not a person who connects easily with rage, but the last few years have been especially intense. And uh, while the pandemic sent some people home wondering what to do with themselves, people in my field had to double down under some very challenging circumstances. And it's not really let up since. So I would have ha loved to have um, the luxury of more mental space to prepare this talk today. But as it is, um, what you're gonna get is some stories and observations and the beginnings of some thoughts that I hope if they spark your interest um, that you'll find the time to pursue a little further. Also, before I jump too far into my topic, I'd like to know how many of you had previously heard of L'Arche. I see plenty of people who are involved with L'Arche here. All right, good, so we have some um, general understanding of what L'Arche is. How many of you had previously heard of Jean Vanier? Yeah. Um, for most of his life, from his 30s to his death at age 90 in uh, 2019, Jean Vanier was known as the founder and the face in many ways of L'Arche. Um, he began a home along with two men with intellectual disabilities, Raphael Simi and Philippe Seux, who are here. Um, in a small uh, village in France in 1964. And he named the, the home L'Arche, which is the French word for ark, like Noah's Ark, a place of refuge. They had previously been living or been shut away in an institution before they came to L'Arche. So one more question. How many of you know why Jean Vanier is now considered a somewhat difficult figure with whom to associate ourselves? A little bit fewer, but quite a few of you. I don't really want to get into that right now. I have limited time, and I'd way rather talk about someone else. But if you would like to, feel free to bring that up in the questions later. The person I would like to introduce you to today is Kara. Kara is a woman with an intellectual disability living in one of our homes here in Lethbridge. She lives with three other women with intellectual disabilities, whom we at L'Arche refer to as core members. I really like this term because it points to their place of prominence and belonging in our large communities, rather than labeling them according to their limitations. Larsh would not exist if it wasn't for them. They're truly central to who we are, the members of our community who are at its heart. 
Kara also lives with a group of assistants, like Bob was saying. Ideally, in her ho home, we would have four of them, one of whom is designated the house leader, altogether a house of eight. This live-in uh, team is responsible to create a home together with the core members, as well as to attend to their support needs, whatever those may be. If you were to meet Kara in person, you would probably assume, and rightly so, that her disability is pretty profound. Although she can walk under specific conditions, she spends most of her time sitting in a wheelchair, which other people move from place to place as they see fit. Kara seems pretty easygoing about this. In fact, often she doesn't seem to be especially concerned with what's going on around her, as long as her favorite activities are available. She likes videos with singing and bright colors. The Australian group, the Wiggles, are a favorite. And she likes having a small magazine of which to flip the pages. Reader's Digest or National Geographic seem to be preferred. Kara does not communicate with words, especially spoken. We've tried to teach her a few signs with limited success. Kara needs support to manage almost all aspects of her life, not only in terms of locomotion, but bathing, dressing, eating, as well as transportation, cooking and shopping. It is easy to see why someone like Kara needs to be in a place like L'Arche, where she is surrounded by people dedicated to meeting these needs. What is not as easy to see, unless you are one of the people who lives with her, is why L'Arche needs Kara. But for those who do live with her, or spend time visiting her home, it's really hard to imagine what we would ever do without her. Kara exudes a certain peace and groundedness, which in turn grounds others. It's not that things don't bother her. She can communicate volumes with her eyes and has ways of letting us know in no uncertain terms when she is upset. But she doesn't let these feelings linger. I think she's mastered the art of living mindfully in the present moment. There are times when the entire rest of the household may be on edge about something, anxiety or tension of some sort. But if Kara is happy, Kara is happy. Other people's business does not drag her down. In this regard, Kara is a real emotional anchor for those around her, and she can help lift others out of their funks. I think it is these qualities of groundedness and not absorbing emotions that aren't rightly her own that have resulted in Kara running her own little confessional in her bedroom and bathroom. When I first came to Larsh in uh, 2007 as uh, the house leader in Kara's home, I remember meeting with assistants to find out how they were doing, only to discover that most of them had already been pouring out their woes to Kara, while alone with her, supporting her in her daily routines. Kara really is a fantastic confidant. She doesn't spill secrets. And that's not just because she doesn't speak in words. There are many ways to communicate without words, and if someone is determined to tell someone else's story, they'll find a way. I've had some of my own secrets told, but Kara holds her own counsel. <coughs> Assistants from overseas have cried to her over their homesickness or processed breakups with her. Something about the way Kara listens seems to bring people comfort and peace. Kara helps to fill her home with joy and laughter. Through the, the unique to Kara games that she likes to play and somehow teaches every new generation of assistants, to her favorite songs, which ensure that music is a part of the daily life of the home. <coughs> if you really want to know what makes Kara tick, come see her surrounded by people who love her and love to see her smile. They will do increasingly foolish things, setting aside all their own dignity and decorum only to be met by a bland stare for minutes on end until suddenly a little tug at the corner of Kara's lip as though she's trying really hard not to smile but just can't help herself. And finally she gives in and we're rewarded with her beautiful smile, rocking in her chair and clapping her hands, Kara's way of communicating joy. For someone whose condition medical textbooks would describe as limiting her ability to engage socially with others, Kara has a unique ability to draw others out. I've often wished that those clinicians could step out of their controlled lab settings 
and spend some time with Kara in her home. One day back when I was the house leader at her home, a community nurse came over to do some blood work for Kara. Kara was not too pleased about this and kept determinedly pushing the nurse away. It was hard to see how it was going to be possible to get the blood work done without getting more people involved to pin Kara's arms down by force. This kind of restraint can be traumatic for everyone and ideally would be avoided if at all possible. So instead, Charlotta, the assistant who was with Kara, patiently sat down by her feet and began to sing. She kept singing Kara's favorite songs until Kara settled down and the nurse easily withdrew the blood she needed. On her way out the door, the nurse asked me, pointing at Charlotta with some surprise, who was that? Oh, I said, it's just someone who lives here with Kara. I wasn't sure what she had been expecting, an overworked, impatient caregiver? Or did she think she'd found instead a highly skilled musical therapist? But Charlotta was neither. How was that moment between Kara and Charlotta possible? It was because Charlotta already knew Kara's favorite songs, because Kara already knew Charlotta's secrets, because they had spent hours together at the supper table sharing in the evening storytelling, jokes and laughter, because Kara had learned to trust Charlotta over all those moments spent playing games together. In short, because Kara and Charlotta were friends. So Charlotta did what any good friend does when the person they love is feeling distressed. She let Kara know that she was there for her and would stay with her until the distress had passed. Now wouldn't it be great in this world if witnessing that moment had not been so out of the ordinary for that nurse? These are the kinds of friendships that are being forged in large communities all around the world every day. Relationships of mutuality, meaning that each person, each of us, has a need of the other, and we each have something essential to give. It's during these quiet moments in the routines of daily life in the home that we discover the unique gifts of each one, and that we are more whole when we are together. There are currently more than 150 large communities worldwide and nearly 30 projects. Those are the seeds of future large communities. <coughs> so what is a large community? Well, it's a group of people with and without intellectual disabilities in a particular locale who have committed themselves to each other in the context of the large identity and mission. Some people commit themselves for a short term, like the university co-op students who come and join us for four months and others, like Kara, for a lifetime. Like Bob mentioned, I've been part of the community in one way or another for over 20 years. Each community has its own leadership and usually one or more homes. The leadership also includes a board of directors. And many communities also have a day program or workshop or some kind of social enterprise project. Here in Larch Lethbridge, we have three homes, like the one in which Kara lives, located here in the city. Our Larch Lethbridge community includes both the core members and the assistants living in these homes, casual respite workers who come in to provide extra support as we need it, the leadership team, board members, volunteers, and a group of other members and friends who have committed themselves to this venture and to each other and who enjoy hanging out with us. So here then is the essence of how Larch understands itself. This is the identity and mission statement, jointly created by all the L'Arche communities around the world who together form L'Arche International. It reads, our identity. We are people with and without intellectual disabilities, sharing life in communities belonging to an international federation. Mutual relationships and trust in God are at the heart of our journey together. We celebrate the unique value of every person and recognize our need of one another. Our mission is to make known the gifts of people with intellectual disabilities, revealed through mutually transforming relationships. 
to foster an environment and community that responds to the changing needs of our members while being faithful to the core values of our founding story. And to engage in our diverse cultures, working together toward a more human society. At this point, I was hoping to show you a video, but it seems that it's not quite going to work out, and I have less time than I thought. So um, <coughs> just a short synopsis, and I will tell you later how you can find it yourself later. Um, it's a, a, from a series of videos that were created as a collaboration between L'Arche International, some local L'Arche communities around the world, and a filmmaker called Michael McDonald, who's actually been here in Lethbridge for some fundraisers. So if you came to any L'Arche fundraisers uh, just pre-pandemic, you might have uh, met him. It's a fantastic series of videos. One of them is from the community in L'Arche in Japan. Some years ago, there was a terrible mass killing in Japan in the prefecture next to the L'Arche community in which 19 adults with disabilities were killed in an institution by a man who'd broken in. And he said he just, um, he w in his own mind, it was a mercy killing. He had decided that these people were living lives of too much suffering and that their caregivers were living lives of too much suffering. Um, and that he thought he could do some good in the world by simply eliminating them. Um, I, would, I would really recommend that you watch it. It's a, it's a fantastically done um, video, very powerful. So I want to reflect a little bit on some things with respect to that and the identity and mission of L'Arche that I just shared. Maybe, right, so here's, I know you're not going to memorize this <laughs> link. <laughs> you can come and ask me later, but it's called 19 Paper Cranes. And if you search on YouTube for L'Arche International, this as I am, hashtag as I am, we used to call it pound, now it's called hashtag. Hashtag as I am, 19 Paper Cranes, you'll find it. So the title of my talk today is People with Developmental Disabilities and the Quest for Belonging. Or in other words, do people with developmental disabilities really belong in our society? For many decades, beginning in the late 19th century, the answer clearly was no. This was the era of institutionalization, when families with children with disabilities were counseled or even pressured to give them up to the state it was not felt that parents had skills to raise such a child, and the state segregated these children away from society through institutionalization. We have largely closed and rejected this way, but the mindsets that led us there have simply, I believe, just subtly shifted over time. They haven't disappeared. Perhaps the story that I just told you from Japan seems extreme, I followed this a bit in the news, and like many mass hate crimes, the perpetrator was suffering from what everyone agreed were delusions and possibly mental illness. However, if I think about that and other hate crimes, I think the seeds of the de delusion or the kernels of the thought that have been taken to extreme ends generally exist more broadly in society by many other people who, of course, are repulsed of the idea of taking them that far. So I'd like to look at the mission of L'Arche in light of what I see as two pitfalls in our thinking that can have very negative effects should we keep following them to their final conclusions. The first pitfall is the one of seeing people with disabilities as primarily or solely in terms of their needs or their neediness. This pitfall is so tempting because the neediness of others may invoke in us feelings of charity or compassion. Being touched by their needs, we seek to provide care and supports which is a good thing. People like Kara obviously need support, not only to have a good quality of life, but to be alive at all. However, if we start primarily with the neediness of people, it is easy to discount their worth, especially in a capitalist society like our own. After all, what does Kara produce of any measurable monetary value? And if people with disabilities are not producing anything, are not even self-sustaining, are seen only in terms of their needs. <clears throat> then of course they will inevitably be seen as a drain on the public purse and public resources. What's the evidence of this attitude? 
while on one very crass level in our provincial budgets. For years, AISH, assured income for the severely handicapped, the government benefit that provides a monthly income for nearly 300,000 people with disabilities in Alberta, was frozen, leaving recipients to make do at sub-poverty levels. Every once in a while, through some advocacy and some goodwill somewhere, it would see a one-time increase. I still remember Bridget Pasteur publicly donating a portion of her paycheck as an MLA to various charities that served AISH recipients in protest of the fact that MLA's substantial income were indexed to inflation, while AISH recipients, who had barely any wiggle room at all, were not. Um, it wasn't until uh, 2018 when AISH was indexed under the NDP, after which it was immediately de-indexed under the UCP when the economy took a dive. Now a wash once again in cash, Danielle Smith's UCP are promising to re-index it. You get the picture, up and down. Caring for needy people seems to be a luxury, an extra, not a necessity. Whereas ensuring that the salaries of highly esteemed people like MLAs are adjusted to consumer price index is seen as simply fair business practice. Meanwhile, many agencies who provide care and support to people with disabilities have not seen an increase of government funding since 2014. So that's irrespective of governing party. LARSH is funded through PDD, which allocates provincial funds to agencies which support people with developmental disabilities. And while we're grateful to receive the stable funding rather than relying solely on donations for such <coughs> vital things as salaries, groceries, or utilities, we're also very aware that we don't make it very high on the list of government priorities. Here's a list of some of our funding challenges, which would make us good and enraged if we just weren't so burned out trying to manage them. We've been experiencing hugely challenging shortages of assistance and respite uh, workers in our homes this past year. This is not unique to L'Arche or even to the whole sector of disability services. Our current funding levels result in our entry level people being paid on par with people at entry level positions in fast food outlets, for example. Or even less. I've heard stories last spring of really experienced people leaving years of service in our sector to go work at KFC or Costco. What we do requires a high level of creativity, caring and responsibility, as well as a lot of front end costs for training to meet government standards and our own. How can we attract the people Karen needs and deserves in her life if the level of support is so low and the level of responsibility is so high? People may come to us very motivated by ideals, but in the end, they still need to earn a living. We're also struggling as an organization. For example, our insurance has more than doubled since 2020 alone. The government has said that this is only the cost of living increases. And for some reason, that in itself is not worthy of providing more funding to cover these costs, even though they are a requirement of our contract with the government. We fund the costs of running our homes, food, utilities, fuel for our vehicles, through room and board contributions from both our core members and our assistants. And we calculate our room and board rate as a percentage of income. With AISH as it has been and wages at 2014 levels, how can we rightly increase our room and board? If you're finding this a little bit of a jarring jump from the first half of my presentation, um, to this half, then you've got a wee taste of how our heads are spinning, trying to hold the realities of our beloved vision and all of these external pressures together. I do want to say that I believe that oversight and accountability are good things, especially in a field where people may be vulnerable to abuse and exploitation. But let me draw you back to Kara's story and the images that you will see when you look up that video from Japan. This kind of love and care cannot be created by signing innumerable checklists and training certificates. All those trainings can give us are more skills to support people well, but they don't do the most important thing, which is to teach us to care for our fellow human beings as equals. That though is hard for government to measure when they're deciding whether or not we're worthy to keep receiving funding. And when we're feeling at our most cynical, it seems that these oversights are not so much about true care as about risk management. If something were to go terribly wrong, where should we assign blame? 
it's much easier for the government to say it's done its due diligence if all the inspections have been done and the boxes have been ticked. So what conclusion may we draw when looking at the story of budgeting for people with disabilities in our province? It's hard for me to come to any conclusion besides that those seen as needing of support are much less valued than those who are supposedly self-sufficient. The narrator in the video asked, do you think our contributions are not enough? So the danger of thinking in terms of charity and neediness, or even as people have having special needs, if you will, in our capitalist society is that they're seen as a burden rather than someone with integral belonging and worth in our society. You'll notice that our large identity and mission statement did not mention caregiving at all. Rather, it pointed to relationships, to each person's value and to our need of one another. And our mission starts with making known the gifts of our core members, again, through our relationship with each other, before finally pointing to the fact that our core, need, core members also need, to have their, also need to have their needs met. Inherent value, relationship, community, belonging, these ways of thinking will get us much further than being a charity case ever can. I think Bob's gonna cut me off. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marie. You've given us much for thought and consideration, and we really appreciate it. So now it's your turn to ask questions. We ask that you keep your commentary and editorializing brief. Uh, get to the point and uh, ask your question. If you're a little timid about coming up to the microphone, you can write your question out, and I will read the question for you if you like. So now the time is yours. So you make yourself comfortable there, and uh, uh, to, to all stand right. to you just stay right there, and they'll, they'll come to you. Okay. So you'll have to back up and go. Yes. Yeah. Can I go that side? Yeah. Okay. For the first time in three times, I'm going to say my name first. <laughs> it's Mary Shillington. Um, I need to tell you that I have been involved with L'Arche since 2009 in various ways. So uh, uh, that, that's the background. Uh, I know that our people uh, come to us uh, permanently and they stay with us until they die. And so maybe you can explain a little bit about that, but also about how uh, as part of the family, uh, that death is honored and so on. I was putting together this PowerPoint late last night, so I can't remember what all I did here. I'll leave that picture up for you while we talk. Um, yes, so uh, one of the guardians in our community once said that the difference um, Turnover is always a big thing in this sector, no matter what kind of living situation you have. Even in L'Arche, people come and go, which is difficult for people with disabilities. But she said, the difference here is that my son has moved into your home and now it's his home. When things change, he doesn't have to move, other people do. And previously, every time some care arrangement had finished, he had had to move to a new home. So our L'Arche homes are people's homes and they can age in place there. Um, and that is a special journey also for us too, to walk with people through that whole, um, t to the end of their lives. Of course, it's not easy. Um, we do have somebody in the hospital right now and we're trying to figure out what things we need to put into place in, at home um, to, to make sure that she can come home and that we can, um, yeah, attend to the things she needs while there. Um, but she, uh, at one point, she had been going to a seniors program uh, for people with disabilities, and she let us know that she was not interested in leaving home anymore. She's retired from that now. So we listened, and we put uh, the support in place for her to stay home and get up at 11 in the morning and have her cup of coffee or whatever and just live her retired life. So she kind of set the tone of what she wanted that to look like, and we figured out how to do it. 
Um, when people pass away in our community, we do find ways to honour their life. There's a lot of grief because they've been members of our family for many years. Um, so we often, pretty soon after somebody has passed away, get the community together to share some memories and just process things together. We've held um, funerals here in the city that Larsh has been um, very involved with, although sometimes the people's families or guardians are, you know, it's a, it's a collaboration together and, um, and really done what we can to honour people's lives. Was that what you were wondering about? Yeah. If you don't have questions, I'll read my last two pages. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Marie, for coming to speak. I'm fairly familiar with your program since I've known Tom Kane for many years, and he was one of the, I believe, early directors of the program. Is that correct? Uh, he didn't direct the program here, but he was really involved for in, oh. in its founding. Mic. Yeah, Tom was not a director in Larch Lethbridge, but um, but very involved in its founding. Were you, was he on the board at some point? He was on the board. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't here then. <laughs> I know him as a friend. Okay, my other question, my name is Knut Peterson, by the way. Um, my other question relates to, are you doing work in collaboration? Are you collaborating with Ability Resource Center in yeah. Lethbridge? Or because they are doing some work in, in the same, I believe, yeah. yeah. So the core members who live with us at Larch Lethbridge um, attend day programs throughout the city of which um, Ability Resource Centre is one. So we have some people who spend significant part of their day there and we do collaborate with them to help yeah, make life well and meaningful for people. I think we haven't done as much collaboration as we might in terms of advocacy or things like that, but we do have a representative from Larch Lethbridge on the council, I forget now the acronym for it, for disability service providers here in Southern Alberta, which unites all of those groups, um, including ARC and Larch, to, uh, for the common work that we need to do. My name is Mark Gettle. So recently we have legislation that allows people to decide when they would like to die. Mm. And originally it was too strict, it was felt too strict, it was mm. just too stringent. And now it looks like the legislation will be expanded and maybe expanded to also people with mental disabilities, whereas initially it was mostly physical. Now a lot of people feel that this is a very slippery slope that will put pressure on those people that are burdened to their family or you know anywhere and that maybe this will be pushing them to make that choice. Also the fear that the governments might just look at this as expeditious to, you know, it's costly to keep these people going. Yep. So what is your view, on <laughs> what kind of safeguards can we put to prevent that slippery slope, but allow those people that are really suffering either mentally or physically yeah. to have that choice? Well, that's a real doozy of a question. <laughs> I, I had thought about bringing, I mean, I have some strong feelings about this, but it's, I, it's still very hard for me to put them all into some logical order. I do not want to be the judge for somebody else, you know, like, like the whole MAID program, um, when it started, it was who, Sue Rodriguez or somebody, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, and I thought, like, who am I to say she or anybody who helped her should be imprisoned, right? Like, who am I to judge her suffering and the choice she makes on how she wants to live the last part of her life? Um, I think, though, that as a society, we really need to re-examine our relationship with suffering. And um, we, we seem to be, um, am I going to say this? We're, we're less and less willing to accept that, I think, as part of our human condition. And if, as a society, we can't come to some peace with that, then how, as individuals, will we see our way through those times in our lives when we face suffering? 
And if we can't come to terms with it as a society, how will we walk well with people through times of suffering? Because you can't live those times by yourself. You need people with you, but if the people around you are scared to witness suffering, they are not going to walk with you well through it. Um, and we could do a lot of good if we came, if we made friends with suffering and saw where um, it can lead us to growth, how it can help us experience joy in a different way, um, all of all of those things, right? Um, yeah, that's a very tiny little snippet, but I think I think we need philosophy and theology to attend to this question in our society. If you're wondering what we need to put in place. Yeah. I, I have some thoughts that are kind of related to that, but they're long, so just, uh, unless you have no more questions. Well, I'll just, I'll just ask for a little clarification. Mm -hmm. What safeguards do we have for for people, say for example, core members in L'Arche, that somebody says, well, maybe we should do <laughs> away with, you know. Yeah, well, back to, back to our identity and mission, I think starting always with what is the contribution, what are the gifts of people who come. You know, we, we don't always have an easy time with our core members. Sometimes things are really challenging. But I found, I remember when I was on the team in the home and we were having a struggle somewhere. We sat down around the table and we started with, let's name the gifts of this person. And people were really uptight about all kinds of details of what we needed to do. And people just closed their eyes. And then we started talking and people started smiling, you know, like everybody has something that you appreciate about them. And if you start from that point, it's much harder to say the world would be a better place if this person was not there. Um, I think, again, it's it's your philosophical starting point, I think, that that puts the safeguard in. I know there's legislations and I'm, I'm not up to date. I don't know all the details. There's some committee somewhere that's supposed to decide where the line is and I don't envy their job at all. Um, yeah, but I think it starts with attitude. Ray, my name is Violet Mikma. Thank you very much for your presentation. Our daughter uh, was on the board for several years in Sudbury, and she has wonderful things to say about your organization. But I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about the controversy of a couple of years ago, if you'd like. And uh, I, I, obviously, your organization has weathered that well. Mm. And I just wonder if uh, you have any insights as a result of that as to how organizations can deal with things, such as those allegations, and also, if you changed any of your practices or protocols as a result, uh, or educated people in a different way, or just uh, if you'd like to comment, I'll give you the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, so for those of you who weren't paying attention to the news on that particular weekend in early 2020, um, what was revealed after um, an inquiry had, had been going on for a while was that Jean Vanier had been in emotionally manipulative and abusive relationships with at least six women without disabilities who had come to him for spiritual direction over the course of some decades um, this had been happening. So this understandably was an enormous shock. I mean Jean Vanier was not only, I mean he was very well respected and um, and honored in society at large, but also in L'Arche. And we were really proud to associate ourselves with him, right? Like this, he had a, a very prominent position, winner of many awards. So we were left like reeling. So what, what do you do with that kind of information? I was very, very grateful for the leadership of L'Arche International at the time, who did not try to hide away anything that we had discovered. If you want to know the details, you can go look on the history timeline on L'Arche International website, follow through the links, and you can find the information there. They gave press releases to the press. It led on the CBC News here. And um, they just got out in front of it and said, this is what we're living with. There it is. We unreservedly, unreservedly condemn the actions. Um, and now we're left with what to do with it. The gifts that Jean Vanier gave 
and what he was able to help support start um, in L'Arche are undeniable. We can't suddenly sort of sweep aside history, right? And nor do we want to. Um, but we have to hold those things in some sort of tension. And I think what it's done is really um, encouraged us to set ourselves free from telling our story as his story and tell it as our own. So maybe five years ago, if I had gotten up here, I would have started telling you about Jean Vanier. Today, I got up and I started telling you about Kara. And I think that is the right thing to do. I think it's a good thing, and I think in some unfortunate way, but it has um, given us a greater freedom to tell our own stories for ourselves. Um, so that's good. And um, I find when I talk to young assistants who know nothing about Jean Vanier, because we're not introducing people to him right away now or to his thinking and his books or anything, they're telling me the same things, the same sort of insights that Jean Vanier was telling years ago. Why? Uh, well, it wasn't really about him, was it? <laughs> it was about the relationships being built in community. It was what he learned from people with disabilities who are still teaching those same things to people now. So I think L'Arche is in good hands because the core members are still at the core. Um, what safeguards are we putting in place? Well, we've done a lot of work um, with really making sure our abuse prevention protocols are really well understood by everybody, that we have some safeguarding in place. There are now places on the L'Arche International and L'Arche Canada websites where people in the community can just go and report something if they don't feel like they're comfortable to talk in their own community about things that they're concerned about. So we've put in a number of kind of safeguarding in hopes to um, prevent, but also if something were to happen, that people would be able to speak up, even if it's somebody in, in a pretty powerful position, much, much faster than, than how this went down. I'm Ian Hurdle, and uh, I think your parents in the audience should be bursting with pride because <laughs> uh, you're so well spoken and erudite. Now, I. <laughs> I can remember when they closed Michener Center, mm -hmm. and it was like we got a hurricane of people with disability. And I could see the caregivers in the system at a loss because the tsunami just overwhelmed even what group homes we had. Mm -hmm. But when I look at it, when we gave sometimes really simple medical care, I watched these people smile, look around, sometimes a really simple operation, they were able to walk again. And I think we probably saved the system a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> whether they appreciate it or not. And I watched a lot of these people develop, and I see them on the streets right now. And I think your organization has sort of couched this and made it work. Thank you very much. There wasn't really a question there, was it? <laughs> I'm going to just. Uh, Marie has a question. Oh. Maria has a question. Uh, Maria Fitzpatrick, and thank you very much, Marie, for a really wonderful presentation. Uh, so there's two things. The first is uh, we consider ourselves a community here in Lethbridge. Mm -hmm. As a community, what can we do uh, to help um, volunteer? What any of these things? What? Okay, and then I'll. Okay, that one. And what's your second one? No, no, I'll get That's to the second oh, one okay, after. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. I was thinking I need the altar call at the end, right? Come forward, get involved. So I have put a few things up there, um, like what I was saying in answer to some of these questions. I mean, the key point, the first thing is. What are your relationships like with people with disabilities? Do you know any? Are you friends? Do you know what their gifts are? How they contribute? So if you want to change the world, you have to start with yourself and your own relationships. If you don't have an opportunity, like 
uh, Dr. Hurdle to see people coming through your door. Um, you're always welcome to come join us at our prayer nights that are every Tuesday night and come hang out and meet us and get to know people. Um, we have lots of needs, like I said. Um, we are desperately in need of assistance um, in some of our homes right now. Um, probably not something any of you are gonna jump into, but I am assuming you have family members and connections, and if, um, if you know anybody that this seems like a good fit for, please get in touch. Um, we are gratefully accepting Christmas donations. So, uh, and all of these you can just get through to Larch Lethbridge on our website or call us. Um, we have positions available on our board of directors. And often there's, we need some expertise. Um, sometimes we don't have quite the mix. Um, it would be wonderful if we had somebody on the board who has some legal expertise, because we're often in front of tw tricky questions and we have to figure out how to translate them into community life. If you have legal expertise, financial expertise, we often need. So yeah, if, if you're interested, give us a call. And there's ways to volunteer. I could think of, um, do you know a funny little need that we have is people who would be willing to take out newcomers to Canada who are learning to drive and just need some practice and they need an experienced driver beside them to just go out for a while. Like, isn't that an interesting little need? That's a need that we have. I have two people right now who've come from tropical countries and they looked outside and they're like, first of all, we're not used to driving on this side of the road. And secondly, what do we do with this snow? And I said, just, we need you to be able to practice and we need somebody to go with you. And we're really busy. And if you could do that, I'd be delighted to hear from you. So, and handy people around the house. There's little things that keep breaking in the homes. <laughs> Would be lovely to have some help. So, so those are some ways. Thank you. Thanks for asking. <laughs> and uh, my last question, uh, Marion, Jen, and myself are on the fundraising mm -hmm. committee. And uh, the big fundraiser for the year is in February with an online dinner. So I'll let you ask everybody <laughs> to buy tickets. <laughs> yes, please buy tickets. Here's the committee here. You can talk to them. And if you're interested, I should say, if you want to know a bit about what it's like to serve on the board, Bob and Mary and Marion, yes, uh, and Jen have all served on our board in the past and I'm sure would be delighted. I'll just volunteer you. Come talk to them. I have, a question. I have another question. <laughs> I'm asking one now. Okay. <laughs> um, you've mentioned assistance many times and I know that it's a challenge to get assistance. Um, we have Anne, for example, yes. who is a house leader, <coughs> is from India. Yeah. Uh, so they come from all over the world. Just talk a little bit about the challenges mm -hmm. of getting assistance. That's a good question. Well, it's a really countercultural kind of invitation, isn't it? Um, when kids are growing up through school and you ask them what they're going to be when they grow up, it's living in a home with people with developmental disabilities is not something most people even know about nor something most parents encourage their kids to do because parents are interested in their kids getting their education and becoming career people whatever their dreams are like this is a really countercultural move and to find those people who are searching for something different is hard to do i find them in all sorts of odd little places but it's hard to put out a mass kind of recruitment campaign that you're going to find those people who are looking for something off the beaten path that makes a difference in the world in this way. So, so that is the first challenge. Um, secondly, there's some, I mean, I, I mentioned the labor shortage. You could probably find somebody interesting to talk to you about all the components that fit into that right now here in Alberta. Um, but some of those things also affect L'Arche. Um, also, as I said, we have people coming from all over the world and immigration has been enormously backlogged this year. Like I have one person who I interviewed a year ago and has been working for a year to get through immigration. I mean, there weren't even hurdles. It was just stuck. Her application was just stuck for months and months on end. And finally, she just arrived. Um, 
So she could have arrived in the summer and now she's arrived to the snow. Um, but we're affected by all those different things. So we've been writing letters to immigration, like what can you do to help us? But also, um, like I said, the wage issue, people need to live, you know, no matter how idealistic they are, we need money to survive. So all of those things uh, figure in to some of our challenges that we face. <laughs> Hi, Bev Mundell-Atherstone. Thank you so much, Marie. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's admirable that rage is not one of your emotions. <laughs> uh, I have to admit I'm filled with rage a lot of times, especially at our government and also at people who support it. Um, I'd like to go t back to your, your comments about capitalism. Mm. Um, I, I think there are various societies that have definitions of humanity that are very narrow and that determines who will thrive and who will not mm -hmm. in the society. And uh, from my perspective, we tend to ignore the broad spectrum of our biology that has contributed to our success as a species. And um, you related to the capitalist society that attaches the monetary value to each of us and our pr productivity. So I'm just wondering, how do you see us as individuals helping to broaden that spectrum of compassion because it affects people with disabilities, people with mental illness, mm -hmm. people who do not fit the narrow definition of male-female. Mm -hmm. There are so many things, so many areas that are not fitted into that narrow definition. How do you see us broadening that out? Mm -hmm. Because I think the broadening of that will help us to have more compassion for each other when we accept each other as humans. Thank you. I'm going to, I mean, yeah, how? <laughs> how do we change the world? <laughs> how do we change ourselves, right? How do we change our own mindsets? It's a big question. Um, there was something that I cut myself short before, but um, I'll try very, oops, my time, quickly to address um, the idea of what makes, what makes the human race good, right? And, and what are we aiming for? We have this idea that we're progressing and moving forward. Um, we had, well, I, I mentioned before the history of institutionalization. Um, that went hand in hand with the eugenics movement. If you haven't already had Claudia Malacrita come and talk here, I think it would be well worth your while. She's from the University of Lethbridge um, and did a, a whole book about the institutionalization and eugenics. What was eugenics about? It was about good birth, right? Trying to prevent people who we thought were substandard humans from reproducing and creating more substandard humans. I think the final conclusion of that way of thinking, if you keep following all the way through, does and did end with the Holocaust. Yeah. And what is often overshadowed by the number of Jews who were killed were the number of people with disabilities who were killed. The concentration camps actually started with people with disabilities and then Jews were added, like the gas chambers. So I looked this up. Uh, I'm gonna find that. 200,000 people with disabilities were killed in the Holocaust. So, um, in the last line of our large um, mission statement, we read that our mission is to work together toward a more human society. People often mistake that for humane, as though we had made a typo. We didn't. Um, why? Humane, I think, is, it really limits us. It's a uh, it can be used to describe everything from advocating for the non-mistreatment of animals to executing other human beings in a supposedly humane fashion, right? Um, and these days, there's an enormous number of people with disabilities who are aborted before they're even born, um, which is seen as a humane choice rather than bringing them into the world. 
I think when we look back at history, it's much easier to see when we have lost our humanity um, than it usually is in the moment. So we're appalled by the cruelty of the Holocaust, and it's much easier to see now the road that led us there. Far from elevating the human race to perfection, the elimination of so many lives, including those people with disabilities, dragged us to a low point that's now, now seen as synonymous with evil. So on the other hand, in L'Arche, we've discovered that the kind of community we end up creating when we build it around our core members moves us in the opposite direction. It's a space that's more gentle, more loving, more patient, more open, more welcoming, more full of joy and laughter, and less about stepping on others to get to the top and more about moving forward together. Will we achieve the pinnacle of human intellectual and physical potential by walking down this, this road to its conclusion? And who can say? But what I can certainly say is that our path does not lead to the, this path, the path that we're walking in L'Arche, does not lead to the destruction of our souls, but rather to a deeper discovery of the good that's within us all. So I'll leave you with that. Very impressive. One last question, and I get that, and that would be, what is the final takeaway you want these fine folks to have today? Well, I would say we all, the great diversity of humans, are part of one family, and you can do something to make that a more real lived experience in our society. So go ahead. <laughs>